Jay, you weren't here last week when we talked about this. Earl, you were behind the glass, but Jimmy Haslam had said extensions were very close for Kevin Stefanski and Andrew Berry. We talked about why they may not have come yet, but that's not what I want to ask today. Let's just assume for the sake of this, it's going to happen at some point. Big picture-wise, and Earl, I want to start with you. Why is continuity at the head coach and general manager position so important for any franchise, but specifically, what would it mean for the Cleveland Browns moving forward? I mean, I think continuity is important as long as it's good continuity. You can have toxic and unhealthy continuity for, for forever, but I think in, in this case here, you have two men that seem to mesh well together, that seem to get along very well. Um, just the chemistry and philosophy, uh, the fact that they're both very transparent, they can, back, they can bounce back and forth off of each other, I think that helps a lot. Kevin Stefanski and Andrew Berry plays a significant role in the Cleveland Browns changing their overall culture. That's just the reality of the situation. And so they've proven to be good human beings. They've proven to be good at you know their occupation. And they have the respect of the players, the owners, and it seems like uh, they're gaining respect from other execs across the NFL. The Browns finally have good continuity. I think having continuity and good continuity is two different things. This is a healthy situation. It seems to be uh, growing. It seems like the seeds that's been, been sold is being watered. And you, you're watering a healthy garden here to continue to have a, a, a winning franchise, a healthy culture, a culture, and somewhere that players actually want to come play at going forward. I think that in the NFL, I always look at it as a maze. And the middle is where you want to get. And there's maybe just one path to it. Maybe there's other paths along the way. If you go this way, you still have a chance of getting back to the right road. But when you change your owner, your, your leadership group, and I, I mean general manager and head coach, you change your point on the horizon. And it's like you're going somewhere and you're three years into that destination and then they rip up the roadmap and you say, nope, you got to go back to go. You got to start all over again and try to get back to where you were. Because more so in the NFL, you're building on every single year what you've done the year before. And there has to be a point on the horizon. We're going to be a defensive uh, focused team with a heavy emphasis of a run. Okay, so that's the Steelers. It, 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 traditionally, historically. Right, right. I know what you mean. They've had three head coaches in my lifetime. They've all won Super Bowls, and the blueprint never changed. It's very difficult because there are cycles to the NFL. There are times when, because the run game was working so much in the 70s, defenses started being built to stop that. Mm -hmm. And then there had to, teams had to pivot. Okay, we see what you're doing over there on that side of the chessboard. Now we're going to be a team that throws the ball more. And I think we're in the middle of a pivot right now. I think that offense got so far ahead of the defense, and you, that's just go back and look at the scores of the playoff games from three years ago. These teams were scoring in the 40s. Mm -hmm. That everybody in the league said, okay, now we're going to focus on defense. And you started seeing teams draft and build their teams more around their defense. And Patrick Mahomes looked human last year. His, he wasn't scoring 45 points a game. His defense was lights out. The Chargers, who a couple of years ago were like a pinball machine, their offense took it because the defense has made a big leap forward. So you have to zig when they zag. And I thought Bill Belichick, for the most part in his career, oftentimes set the trends and at the same time was responding to them on the other side of the ball because he knew what was coming yeah. because they all followed him. And when he made the tight end a position of focus, mm -hmm. what did the rest of the NFL do? Everybody else did it. Everybody else Everybody running else. tight end sets. They Everybody the, else. They had the best pass catch and tight end tandem that I think you would Maybe ever. ever. See. Yeah. Because there were two of those guys. Yeah. So with Gronk and Hernandez, the rest of the league was like, wow, what are we going to do? Yeah. How are we going to compete? And thus, Travis Kelsey was born. Yeah. And now you're seeing stars there. So when you're changing your leadership every three years, you're perhaps changing your point on the horizon. Because if I asked you, what are the Browns about? What are they? Over the last 20 years, 
They've been built on what idea? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, even in a pass-happy league, they ended up with the, one of the game's best running backs. So they're not necessarily about running the ball. They're not necessarily about throwing the ball. It's kind of been a hodgepodge because they wash, rinse, and repeat every three years. So I like the fact that Andrew Barry and Kevin Stefanski are here for a minute and I really will like the fact if we see these extensions that everybody tells me, don't worry, they're coming. So yeah. I'm not worried. Yeah. But if they don't come, I'm very worried. Because now you're so late in the cycle, what do you do now? Well, I mean, they're, they're, they're coming. I do believe that they're coming. I, that's, and I believe they are. Yeah. But they but better be coming. If you look across sports, the most successful franchises are the ones with stability. That's it. It's the Ravens. It's the Steelers. It's the Heat. It's the Spurs. These are the teams that the GM and the head coach have been married together for X number of years. They know what they want. They know they've done it long enough that they've made the mistakes early on. How many times have I said, you have to give guys long enough to learn from their own mistakes? That never ha has happened with the Browns. You make a mistake, you're out. Next guy in. They make a mistake, they're out. Next guy in. You have to give them time to learn from their mistakes. And the Browns have made mistakes. Andrew Berry's made mistakes. Kevin Stefanski's made mistakes, but they've had the time to learn from them. And the longer you do it, the better you get at it. And the Heat have a certain way that they go about doing things, and they know what they look for, and, and they identify those players, and they win with them. Spurs the same way with Pop and R.C. Buford. They've been there forever. Miami, it's Spolstra and uh, Pat Riley, obviously. They've been there forever. Baltimore, it's John Harbaugh. Been there forever. Steelers, Mike Tomlin. They just had a change in GM for the first time in forever. Like it's always, so you know what you're getting, you know what you're looking for. The Browns have never had that opportunity because they just keep constantly, to your point, they're constantly changing the target of what they're shooting at because everybody who comes in has their new way of doing things, has their own way of doing things. And it's just, you just get stuck in the mud. So I'm excited for it. I'm excited to see some sort of stability, continuity. The Cavs have actually had that for the first time in forever. Even, but LeBron was so good, he erased it all. Like, that was the thing that always, I, when I used to talk to teams when I was covering the NBA, was you have to have stability. Like, you've got to have this culture of stability here, or you're never going to win. But LeBron was so good that he just wiped it all away. Well, what's amazing, though, is had that stability been there, and they had been changing coaches like underwear, he wins more than one. Probably. Because, like you said, it's hard to hit a moving target. Yeah. And the target was never standing still. Yeah. Yeah, had they... I don't know. I like, we could go down a ton of rabbit holes with that whole thing. But let me, let me ask you this. Ultimately, he was here 11 years. He got one championship. What if, and I know this is a big if, but you had a caliber of Phil Jackson, mm -hmm. Pat Riley, even Spolstra, who has become a clone of Pat Riley because he was a sponge to Pat Riley. Yeah. But like, I, I often wonder, had the right head coach been in place, Maybe LeBron never leaves, and he's got five. Well, no, because coaching coaching doesn't matter to LeBron. But like, doesn't great coaching? He's never, you know, what if he had a Phil Jackson? I think he loves to talk about Pop in glowing terms, and Pop talks about him but in glowing terms. But he could never terms. play for Pop. He could. They would strangle each other. I know they would. It, it just would Like, they can sit on opposite sides of the rooms, and they can tell each other how wonderful they are, but if they had to be in the same room together for nine months, it would not go well. I, I would argue that the Cavs actually had two phenomenal coaches and fired them both. Fired one guy twice. Mike Brown is a phenomenal coach. Yeah, he's really... He's phenomenal. And he got a bad rap. Is Ty Lue the other one Ty Lue's the other I one I think Ty Lue is a great coach. They never... Like, they made... And, and I, I really like JB. I really like JB personally. But I, it just feels to me like they made so many mistakes at the end of the championship era trying to restart this thing. They made a ton of mistakes. And they've covered a lot of them. They were able, like, they've done a really nice job, again, learning from your mistakes. Kobe's had time to learn from them. They've done a really nice job of developing guys on the margins and that sort of thing, making the big trade. They've hit on all their draft picks, all of them. Yeah. They've hit on their picks. But the one piece that they never really recovered from, to me, was firing Ty Lue. And he is a postseason coach. He's a coach... He's a coach for a veteran team, and I know this was a young team for the last couple of years. He's a coach who's going to give you the rope. during the, Like, they stopped the season and went and got drunk in Napa for two days. 
Like in the middle of the season, they said, you know what? That's enough basketball. We're going to Napa and we're going to get drunk for two days on wine. And then we'll come back later and we'll restart this thing later. Figure it out. And, but that's what, that's what he allowed them to do. But then in the playoffs, he pulled them in and he is one of the best postseason coaches in the NBA today. Wow. I would take Ty over almost anyone. The way that he draws up ATOs, the way that he his mind works. And to me, that's, that's where the that's coaches critical. are earning his money. That's critical. And that's why the one mistake to me that this organization made, and it was, like, it was ugly between Ty and Kobe that first year post-LeBron, it was ugly. And I've had people say he had to go. Like Ty was basically begging to get fired. But had they, like Miami didn't fire Spolster when LeBron left. Had they stayed the course with the coach, I think we'd be having different conversations. What's the chances we get him back? Zero. Ty? Yeah. He's in L.A. I mean, I know he's in L.A., but I mean, the Clippers as a, as, as a team, they're older. The Clippers the don't seem like they're The man is in L.A. Going. He ain't coming back. I'm just asking the question. <laughs> I'm just asking the question. No, no, Ty, you had your chance there. And he was the hot up-and-coming coach at the time. They paid him a ton of money. And it's funny, like... He just signed a five-year extension last year, too. Yeah, he ain't going anywhere. But it's funny because, like, Dan wanted Blatt. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Dan wanted Blatt. Don't even go there. So that's the worst hire in Cleveland sports history. Oh well, next to Charles Frederick Kitchens, like that's one and one A. No, or John I, I still I still say Kitchens or Beeline. Beeline. <laughs> I told you last week. I got a yeah, call. Beeline was bad. I got too. a call two weeks into training camp. He's miserable. He's regretting his decision. I'm like, we're two weeks in. Well, look He's what it's the first in. move that he made. Like there was there were he. There was a racial play oh, yeah. right off the yeah, bat. Yeah. And, and I mean, first of all, anyone that thought that was going to work, that, that, that was Dan showing faith loyalty well, and Michigan loyalty. But this loyalty. is where I'm going with it is, like, this is what's hysterical about, like, if you, if you really watch their moves, Dan fell in love with Blatt and wanted Blatt, and Griff was like, oh, my God, okay. Hey, Ty, can you come here and clean up the pieces when this thing implodes? And that's exactly what he did. They fire Blatt and Ty's there. Same well, Dan, thing here. Dan gets enamored with Beeline. Like they're hiring all of these, or they're they're interviewing all of these young assistant coaches, Jamal Mosley. Uh, 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 man, I, there was a whole list of guys on their list, and it was all young guys. Mm-hmm. And then they go and hire John Beeline, and Kobe's like, "Oh my God, hey JB, can you come in here and be the safety net for when this thing implodes?" And it imploded far earlier than anyone thought it would. What do you get fifteen but, games. No, the All Star break. He, he, oh, he made it to the All Star break. He made it to the All Star like break. Far no, earlier. he left at the All Star break and said, "Keep the money, I'm out." Yeah, <laughs> which is never. Happened. But like, it's just like it was uh, the exact same. We got to do reads, but uh, Guardians now in the seventh, still scoreless. It, 